You're listening to the Paranormal UK Radio Network. <laughs> Hello. Is that the famous astronomer, Sir Patrick Moore? It is, very much so. Any news on the space front? No, quite so, quite so. Elon Musk has just designed and developed five gigantic state-of-the-art rocket ships. All members of Parliament, along with the American Senate, have first-class tickets aboard them, you see. They're told they're going to the moon. Told? Where exactly are they going, Sir Patrick? The new anomaly discovered recently, astronomically. A huge black hole. Welcome to Twin Souls. Twin Souls is brought to an association with the Paranormal UK radio network, your host, Philip Kinsella. Now we have an amazing guest on today, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and his name is Barry Fitzgerald. He's, uh, he's well known throughout the paranormal field of investigations. And I'm just going to read a little bit here on Barry's bio, brief bio, and I think you'll get the picture of just how great this guy is. Author Barry Fitzgerald has over 30 years experience within the world of the supernatural in which he is known and has taken him to new levels of intrigue and mystery. Appearing on Ghost Hunters, Ghost Hunters International and Destination Truth, he headed a team on the American NBC owned Skyfire Network and explored a quandary of the paranormal and supernatural phenomena around the globe. He was recognized for his work in the paranormal world and received the award of Paranormal TV Personality of the year 2016 and 2018 from PSW based in the Netherlands. Barry's research evolved and took him out of his comfort zone and into Irish myth, legend and folklore that has led him into the shadowy depths of the underworld, not only in Ireland, but around the globe and covering shocking similarities between cultural encounters with the unknown. Hello, Barry. How are you? Philip, uh, I'm absolutely fantastic and thank you very much for having me on. No, that's wonderful. And I have to say, um, your new book, co-authored with Brian Allen, it's a chilling account. The book is called The Deception of Gods and Men. The price of power has never been so great. And, you know, I know that we met up at a, a conference not long ago, and I was like bugging you uh, about your research because I was so enamored by your, your speech, by, about your lecture that you did. Mm -hmm. And so tell us, this new book, The Deception of Gods and Men, I mean, what was it that inspired you to write this book? I think, Philip, um, from the onset, um, the way that I tend to look at the paranormal, I, I, I don't get roped into the mainstream crux of, of what we believe the paranormal to be, um, which is fed to us. Instead, I, I, I tend to step outside the box and look at things slightly differently. Um, and I think that in itself has served me well to identify this particular phenomena. Um, and the book itself was, it, it, it's, it really tackles this idea of what is it that we're possibly communicating with that, that comes forward from the veal to, to commune with us. Um, and, and do we see similarities with, the phenomena that we tend to see within our seance rooms, for instance, do we see similarities within in the field of ufology, in earth spirits, in jinn and the old gods? The further we push back, I think this book was really designed to challenge this idea of are we looking at the same thing? 
Yes, and you know, I think you know from because you're you're from good old Ireland, and there's a <laughs> lot of myths and legends out there which are really intriguing. And I I have to agree with you because the phenomena, whether or not you're dealing with ufology or you know the spiritual side um, of communicating with the dead or the afterlife, and certainly within the the folklore, which in in more ways than not is actual actual reality, mm-hmm. but it's hard to try and pinpoint exactly what it is that we are dealing with. And I know that you've been looking for the Holy Grail with regards to that. But um, tell us a little bit about um, your background as well. And how did you get involved in this subject matter, Barry? <laughs> well, I, I think um, like many of us, we've had experiences in our early youth and I was no exception. I grew up in a haunted house. Unbeknownst to me, I, I have to say, as a child, my parents sheltered us very well um within that within that particular building but i had my own experience where i i seen this the, this figure on the stairs and and from there i've really been i really have been steered in in this direction to explore the paranormal because by the time i reached uh 17 years of age i had said enough of this you know, I had I had read uh, John Keel's books and and I was mesmerized by all the, the various different authors that were out there. But I said enough, mm. enough. And I wanted to, to go out and make my own path. And mm. so I left everything behind and and I went off and six months is all it took. And and I was I was brought neatly back onto the same path. And suddenly the realization struck me. I'm back here again. And 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 that was it. You know, at, at that particular point, I said, "Okay, this is where I'm meant to be," um, and and I I really um, threw myself into it to try and understand what is it that we're communicating with. How is it communicating? Are there any side effects of mm-hmm. of dealing with this particular phenomena that we should be aware of? Um, so all of this was 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 really coming out, and and with with the the books that I was writing before, such as the influence, the influence was written back in 2012, and and that looks at at when these attachments cling on to the body, how they manage to do it, and what they're doing to the body physically, um, and the book itself addresses how we can switch that back, and 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 gain a release. From, from these particular attachments and, and understand them more and how we can spot them quicker. Um, and, and also my explorations within the, the uh, in the mists of gods. Um, and that took me into the, the underworld in, in, um, in Belize, mm. um, the Mayan underworld. And, and we had very, very bizarre, strange encounters there. And that brought me back then to my own side of of the Atlantic, where I ended up exploring these underground worlds, um, various mine shafts and and, and things like that, and continued to have these experiences. And I was seeing that there's, wait a minute, this is a common common factor that seems to be slipping through all the different fringe research fields. And that really inspired me on to create the book, of course, which we have now, Mm. Uh, the inf- or the the deceptions of gods and men, and I can see now that the book is written, and I and I, I, look, I look back on it, and and I've had the time now to be able to listen to the audio book um, being played back to me, and and listening to someone else reading it, that I can see that I've been influenced myself um, over that period of time to release this information. Mm, almost guided, is it? Were. I, in, indeed, yes, uh, very very much so. I think that we all have this inward uh, knowing when we start to deal with, uh, you know, elements of the bizarre or, uh, you know, periods of high strangeness and, you know, trying to translate that information. And I think this is the problem. I think you've you've hit the nail definitely on the head with regards to trying to fathom out what it is. And, you know, areas of the gin, you mentioned the gin as well, too, because, you know, mm-hmm. it could be there's been the question of whether or not we are being deceived by this intelligence or this energy or whatever it may represent itself as. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what I love about your your book, The Deception of Gods and Men, and indeed your work, is that you're so methodical about everything that you do. And you brought a brand new perspective towards the table of not just ufology, but 
but also the spiritual aspects as well, because, you know, we tend to think that such subjects are, uh, you know, separate and, and put into different boxes. But I, I think you're right. I think that there's some connections there. Yeah, I, I think that that pigeonholing of, of, of various different phenomena has in itself served to disconnect us from from the greater phenomena. Um, and and I have to say, we've had individuals within those various different uh, um, fields of research that have been very, um, I suppose, what would be the word that I'm looking for? Obsessive with with their their, their viewpoint mm -hmm. of 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 their phenomena, and um, that they will not entertain any other leaking phenomena, I should say, within to, or into their research path. And we saw that especially within ufology, um, mm. when when uh, accounts of Bigfoot uh, that was appearing along with a UFO tended to be thrown out. Yes, that's right. Absolutely. And, 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 and those, those, th that was exceptionally important that, that, you know, instead of trying to, to, to slice and dice the phenomena um, and be protective of that particular pigeonhole, um, we really needed to, to, to strip this all away and, and, and look at the greater picture and see the common factors that weaved in through the various different fields. Yes, and certainly I, I agree with you because I think, and I totally understand that within ufology, and let's take that as an example, that with regards to the phenomenon itself, it's been packaged and boxed and sold as this is what it is, a nuts and bolts craft with mm -hmm. you know physical aliens. And uh, in a stereotypical level, I think the media have actually created this within the minds of the public, and they've gone away believing in that. Um, but what is interesting is your perspective of how you view this phenomenon phenomena almost mm. like trickery and it is deception isn't it oh oh, oh yes ab absolutely and you know it's 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 a strange thing whenever we consider about that that aspect of the nuts and bolts ufo um because that leads us into another particular area in the phenomena that naturally appears mm. um and can take solid form against the material um, and the and the, the the black budget projects that we're creating tends to muddy the water. Um, so there are various different things now that I'm that I'm beginning to look at to see how we can put a greater divide in in the phenomena which we have created against the phenomena that they create. Um, and you know this this idea of of the nuts and bolts, it's it's certainly part of the true phenomena can materialize in the solid form but mm -hmm. also we have to remember that within the seance rooms of old arms fingers hands can materialize solidly within the seance room and that's all there is nothing else beyond the shoulder of that particular arm there is nothing there so this materialization can happen and they do make it happen and um, so the idea of something which is nuts and bolts is not far from what we tend to see within the seance rooms mm, yes that's right i agree with you and also the uh, the fascination that you know a lot of very powerful uh, human individuals have been kind of like misled by this alternative force. So in your opinion, Barry, I mean, how do you see this force? I mean, what do you feel is going on with it? And and how, what is what is its plan, ultimate plan? Um, what's its end game with regards to, to where it thinks it's going? The end game that we can see from, from our perspective right at this moment in time is, is this idea of, I suppose that there's one way to put it: He who owns the body wins, mm. and and that in itself is is a key factor because where they're based is a place of nothing. So they need to get back here. And notice, I said they need to get back here because they were here to begin with. Mm. Um, so when they pass, when they pass through. That, that that doorway into this other place, they want to get back. Their, their focus is to get back and they will use whatever means necessary to deceive us so that our uh, innate 
uh, fight or flight response within the body does not activate. Therefore, they're able to get their hooks in and they're slowly able to get deeper and deeper um, into the particular subject um, that that has brought them forward. Um, And that in itself um, has very damaging um, potentials. However, there is um, um, certainly precedent has been made that we can see that people will openly invite this to occur. Um, and that in itself is, is, is of course, um, leads us down into another rabbit hole. Um, but <laughs> we do we do see this 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 perspective occur, and this brings us neatly into this idea um, of esoteric practice of the yeah. occult. Um, and we have to understand that no matter what we're doing, whether it be in UFOs, whether it be in uh, earth spirits, jinn, um, within the seance rooms, or even anyone out having a paranormal um, investigation, you're calling that forward. Mm-hmm. That in itself, call it whatever you want to call it, but in its, in its truest nature, that is an esoteric practice. Mm-hmm. So all of the phenomena can be called through esoteric practices. That in itself is something we need to really consider and let that settle, that we can call this through with esoteric practices. So therefore, what is this? This is not little bebop coming from Mars that is that has decided to intercept one of our one of our one of our beacons. That is not the case. This is an esoteric practice. This is something which is much, much closer to us than Mars. Mm. Do you know, it's interesting. I was sorry to interrupt you, Barry, but, um, you know, with regards to talking about what you're you're explaining here is, for instance, the lights that uh, UFOs normally come in a variety of colors of lights. Mm -hmm. And the same with spirit communication. Uh, Mediums sometimes see lights as well, too. So what you're saying is that the phenomena will morph according to the structured belief system of the individual. And that's how they get hooked in. Is that what you're saying, the phenomena itself, uh, Philip, what we tend to see is a hook and bait. Mm-hmm. That's what tends to happen. Bait us and then the hook us. And mm-hmm. that's it. That is the, is the process as a whole. So what do I mean by that? Um, when, when we tend to get the lights uh, that, that we just mentioned there, um, that is the bait. And if we're if we're working with that any more than 20 seconds, that has an effect within the the uh, brain rhythm of the witness. What they tend to do is during that particular process, they need to override our our response, our intuition, if you like. They need to override that. And that usually happens after around 20 seconds. So they've got us by the light and we, we naturally we go, what's that? You know, we're, we're suddenly caught and mesmerized by that. And it, it, it draws the, the brain into a theta rhythm. And that particular rhythm is a place where we tend to go into deep meditation. It's also a place where we tend to go for hypnosis. It's also a place where we tend to go that false memory can be imprinted. Mm-hmm. Hence the 20 second rule. Mm-hmm. So they need to get us into that because if they don't, we see the true nature of that particular phenomena through our own body's responses. Our intuition, our seat of discernment kicks in and lets us know. However, if this continues any longer, it can override it. Um, and that, that, that is a problem. Yeah. So do you believe then, Barry, that certain powerful individuals are deliberately um, executing these, um, you know, these initiations to bring this force in? Do you think there are people here who are well aware of what they're dealing with on some level? Do you think they themselves are also deceived? You know, um, a lot, a lot of people um, would think that this in itself is conspiracy theory, Mm. that that we have we have institutions we have we have um aeronautics companies calling in um various different um uh, um beings from the other side we think what what nonsense uh, is, is, he, is he talking but that is not the case 
because we have documents, for instance, that does show in 1968, the Douglas uh, Aeronautics Company, um, it was based in, in, in America before being absorbed by Boeing in, in 1997. They were using a Ouija board and they were being sponsored by the company uh, to use Ouija board communications with what they believed were aliens in order to get themselves uh, a way ahead with, with uh, specialized engine designs. Mm. Um, now, this was happening in 1968. The paperwork is there. I have it. Um, and I've, I have to say, I've gone through that particular paperwork. And there was, from my experience, there was red flag after red flag after red flag. These people were dealing with things that they just did not understand. And, you know, we, we came from from a, a species that have been communicating with these things for millennia. And when we go back far enough, for instance, if we go back to Greece, for instance, um, um, early Greece, we had, we had kings, we had priests that were going to these locations, which were near rock, um, I, I, I might add rock, we, we might come back into that particular connection later, but they ended up going to this place where there was a lot of rock and they had this communication with the word. That's what it was known as, the word. And it gave um, information on a variety of topics um, from sociology to government to economics, warfare, crime, medicine, um, engineering and science. And they shared this information, but a common a cost. Um, and that information was to really set into, into practice how to rule us. So this has been going on for a long time because when we bring this back to 1968 and we bring it back to the Douglas Aeronautical Company, we find out that during the Ouija board uh, communications, they were also getting information on sociology, government, economics, warfare, crime, medicine, engineering, and science. Um, but when they started to press the phenomena on the engine designs, strangely enough, communication started to break down. <laughs> and we see this time and time and time again. They will lead us on to for that, for that um, uh, who can bait situation. And I find it bizarre that we as, as, as a species, when we're communicating with these energies from beyond the veil, we could we could end up with uh, one truth, but three lies. And for some reason, we become fixated with the truth and completely ignore the three lies and continue to communicate with this. Like that in itself really should spark our fight or flight. That should spark our instinct to say, this is not right. We need to stop communication with this particular entity. Um, because if we're going to be led down the garden path by getting three lies and one truth, what else is it going to do? Yes, that's right. And, you know, I mean, I, I read your book, uh, The Deceptions of, of Gods and Men, and it gave me the willies. I'm sorry, I've got to say it. I mean, it scared me because, <laughs> um, because your your thoughts, the way that uh, you and Brian Allen as well, because he, he helped uh, contribute towards the book. But mm -hmm. I, I know that a lot of your work and your research has really fueled this project. Mm -hmm. um, one of the scary parts was for myself personally, on a personal level, um, I've always thought that there was another side I've always believed in that I've always believed that there's goodness and righteousness but you're right because when you've had these variety of experiences that seem to you know just step into your life and mesmerize you I suppose like a, a moth caught to a to a light um, it, it, you then feel this real a compulsion to discover more about its reality and um, we don't seem to be making any headway in that department no. in terms of understanding um, but what's interesting Barry going back before we talk about the stones which are very interesting um, you said that they they need us they need our bodies they mm -hmm. it's so it, it's almost as if that they are you saying then Barry that they would have had 
as some type of existence in a material world, and that because they have now passed back to their realm of absolute nothingness, that they are trying everything they can to be- get back here again. That's, that's correct, yes. Um, and uh, we we tended to see this through communication, th- through, for instance, the skull experiments hmm. on the 6th of March 1998, where yeah. we were introduced to an entity known as Sharon S., who admitted to come from a dimension of nothingness. Now, it should also be pointed out that this particular dimension is exceptionally close to us. Um, and uh, we also seen this this idea of, of this layer of nothingness from the late Robert Monroe. Um, and he was a specialist in out-of-body experiences, and he was able to be tested within the laboratory setting. Phenomenal, phenomenal uh, results were obtained through Robert's abilities. But he spoke of a layer or an area that was closest to here and now. And he said the chief inhabitants were subhuman yet able to act and think independently. But this was a this this layer was absolute blackness. And the problem was that, that when he was going th- through his OBE experiences, he said that if you if you traveled fast through that darkness, you attracted them. And the trick was to travel slowly. But he said on several occasions that when he returned, something returned with him. Something came back through that doorway with him. And he says that if if we continue to do this, we're going to start creating leaks. And uh, and that, it seems, is what possibly is going on. Mm, and certainly when you see cases like Skinwalker Ranch, we've heard recently mm. um, that all the, most of the public have been aware recently, that is, that most of those that were connected with the scientific investigations were we're talking about hitchhikers, mm-hmm. and that is a remarkable uh, example that you have given with mm-hmm. regards to this type of phenomena. So, I mean, you know, I, I just it scares me senseless to think that, you know, that, you know, OBE um, experiences like Robert Monroe um, had gone through this this uh, world of complete darkness, of emptiness, nothing. Mm-hmm. And stepping lightly, it reminds me a little bit of a Lara Croft uh, um, movie and where they had to walk very gently across this land and the slightest motion would set these creatures coming out from the rocks. Mm-hmm. And, um, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, that, 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 that makes me think. I think that was uh, the, the second film that Angelina Jolie mm-hmm. played, the uh, Lady Lara Croft in that. That scared me. So how amazing is that? I mean, you know, I mean, obviously it's horrific in nature, but what, you know, when this energy, this force when it comes through with the individual, mm-hmm. I mean, does that mean then, Barry, that it will not leave that person alone? That it will attach itself to that individual? Not necessarily. Um, mm-hmm. It can. It can. Someone within the area, it can certainly um, attach to, um, and uh, it can stay here indefinitely. It will eventually have to return if it has not connected to someone. And that is the, that's the important fact is that it has to connect to someone for in order for it to to anchor itself here. And you know, I was when, whenever I wrote the, the book, the influence about how these energies attach to people and how we can reverse the 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 effects of that. I was given a warning from call it from beyond the veil, and it was very very clear. It said, do not become too bright or they see you. Now, at the time of writing the book, I did not know what that meant. It was years later that I was speaking to to an associate in, based in, in, in America, and they were involved with experiments that were going on around the world into EVP sessions. And the same question was being asked these things beyond the veil how do you see us and each one that was coming back was the same it it replied as light and suddenly then the warning that i was given years before do not become too bright or they see you it really hit home and uh, so you know this this idea that uh, that we produce a light, I suppose, a, a, maybe a spiritual light, or whatever. I'm, I'm I'm not quite sure. Yeah, 
um, but it's it's something in itself that seems to attract them. It's it's you know the old saying, "Bright lights attract flies." That's perfect for for the way that this this particular thing can interact. Yes, and you know that's interesting because I remembered researcher Paul Sinclair having an experience with a strange. Um, male entity mm-hmm. he he knew there was an entity that that said that paul was bringing down the light mm-hmm. and what you just said there just immediately uh, as you know paul sinclair is also a researcher and author like yourself mm-hmm. and he's done a lot of research in bempton but he was told you're bringing down the light mm-hmm. and i think you know that 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 in itself scares scares it would scare a lot of people because you know if we become brighter and lighter then perhaps the phenomena you mean we act like a magnet to it is that what you're saying barry yeah it 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 can attract um no there are particular processes that that people who are um more awake let's say um, Mm -hmm. and and more open spiritually can actually calm that down. They can they can they can open up that particular process, do what they're doing, and then retract that back. We don't need to be burning like like a hundred watt halogen bulb all the time. <laughs> Um, we we can you know obviously that light is there. It's part of our spirituality, and we can use that. We can use that for our benefits um, um, within our daily daily lives and, and when we go to particular locations, we can tap into that particular ability and work with it and then put it back in its case. Yeah, because I've always believed in good and bad. And I've always, I hopefully have always maintained the right side of of that goodness. Um, But, you know, Barry, I need to ask you a question here um, with regards to the the good and the bad. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I respect every single opinion or, you know, belief that I hear about. So let's say that when we die, when we mm. physically expire, um, do you believe that we, our consciousness, um, returns to source, or do you think it gravitates somewhere else? And the reason I'm asking this is because you came out with an amazing analogy of this that, that completely threw me. Do you want to to explain uh, the process of that, Barry, at all? Sure. Um and what we were, what we, the, the hypothesis that we put through in the book is that within us, each one of us, there is, a, there is a, a remarkable trinity of life. And first of all, we have to get away from this idea of of using soul and spirit and using them as an interchangeable um, um, phrase, because that's not the case. The soul is a very separate entity within us, as is the spirit. And the soul's job is to keep the body alive, this meat suit, as they call it. Its, <laughs> its, soul, its, its, its job is to keep us alive as long as possible. Um, so that the spirit, of course, has the experience. Now, at point of death, the spirit leaves. It's gone. It goes to where it's meant to go. Call it Belvedere, call it the source, call it what you want. It retracts back to that. Mm -hmm. Now, it's the soul. The soul, it is the source of all our psychic abilities. And it, unfortunately, it thrives in our lowest energies um, and it deals with our wants, our needs, our lusts. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, It's the things that drive the body to stay alive as long as possible. Um, but the soul itself can last and can linger around the body for days, if not weeks. Um, and what we what we put through in our hypothesis is that everything that we are communicating with, everything, is the soul, not the spirit. The spirit is gone. The communication with spirit, we believe, is not going to happen. It's gone. But what we are left with is the soul, and that's why the soul retracts. It wants back to here. It came from here, a materialistic world. It came from here, and it wants to come back to here as long as possible. And, you know, there was there was a, a wonderful quote within the opera, uh, opera uh, Omnia, and the text there speak of a balanced trinity um, in which the, the shadow possesses the the, the, the in which the, 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 the soul, sorry, I, I use the two terms, shadow, or sorry, soul and shadow together, um, in which a, a perfectly balanced trinity 
it really it really is a, a, something to fear yeah. um, in regards those others that are coming through the veil. Um, that balance is remarkably powerful. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, we live in, in, in a climate today where where it's easy to create imbalance. Mm -hmm. And and what we eat um, and the way we live today is having a serious effect on how that trinity um, is able to survive. Mm. And, you know, I, I think it's interesting because people report shadow people. Um, you know, that's that and a lot of the supernatural phenomena, because when mm. you have a UFO appear, and I have argued this as well, because I believe there are two stages to the experience. One is a not just a physical observation, but then a, a full integration on a personal level of the human mm. psyche with the forces behind it. But one of the things I find really interesting is that this power this force that's coming in is almost because you have mentioned also the the gods of the past and the jinn you know mm -hmm. about this energy so do you do you yourself barry feel that this this energy this intelligence works as a united force or you know do you think there are individual aspects to that that nothingness at all i know you mentioned briefly about that um they, they they do have their own um, uniqueness to a certain degree. I see. Um, but they are it, it's basic, and and in fact, you know, whenever whenever I think of it, um, really, what's coming back through could easily be classed as energy vampires, for use of another term. Yeah. Um, they try and infuse themselves into a, into a balanced trinity which in itself can cause terrible upheaval and when when we go into a situation where for instance we we possibly uh, we we enter a, a haunted house for instance yeah um and and suddenly the hair stands up in the back of our neck um, and we're not quite sure why there's visually there's nothing there to trigger us off but there's something is triggering off the body that in itself that particular process is um um a a unique part of the communication between soul and body. The soul communicates to the body to react for the conscious brain to become aware. Beware, there's another soul here. Mm, very interesting. So, and, and the thing is, Philip, if we don't react, well, then everything's fine. The nature of that soul is peaceful. We don't react to that. It, we get a good vibe. Everything's nice. Everything's wonderful. Um, but if if that, no matter what, no matter what appearance it takes, again within the first twenty seconds, um, we are able to detect the true nature of that particular being. That's very interesting. And you know, Barry, I think also with regards to what you're saying, it makes absolute sense um, because, you know, the decompartmentalization of all this phenomena. And I have also argued, where are the aliens? Because, you know, mm. although we can track the UFOs on radar and through mm. film, the genuine ones, that is, mm -hmm. um, and we know the phenomena is real, but I've always argued, where are the aliens? And this, this is the big debate. And I think that with regards to your theoretical model that you've created, and of course, uh, you know, the, the thoughts that you have with regard to this is very challenging indeed but i also will say to you just just off the record off the record really i mean on show but off the record that mm -hmm. you know since i've began to have my own thoughts about what's really going on the phenomena seems to have lessened basically <laughs> and it seems to have let go because the last the last sighting, the major one, was on the 9th of April 2016 at 11.15pm at night with me and my brother. And that was really very intense, but nothing since then. So I think that, you know, for this force, this power, uh, you know, ultimately, uh, what you're saying is it is it, after survival, because it's a bit like the invasion of the body snatchers. Isn't it? Mm. Yeah, you know, it, it originates from us. That that's something that that's that's the big wake up call. This originates from us. Um, but if you don't fall for the deception, it's amazing how much of that phenomenon backs off and gets yes. the hell out of dodge. Yeah, and um, because the moment that you become suspicious of it, poof, it's gone. 
Yeah. And, you know, I've got to say to you uh, as well that, you know, because as human beings, of course, we go through the gestation period, mm -hmm. the birthing cycle, and then having mm -hmm. to go through the the whole issues of growing and developing mm -hmm. um, this force this power obviously doesn't want to go through that process mm -hmm. uh, so it wants to inhabit a body uh, temporarily uh, for it to coexist within uh, and you know and, uh, to what end I'm not sure so where do you think this power this force where is it leading them Barry ultimately is it just about existence or I think course? yeah I, I think it really comes down to existence in a way oh. um mm -hmm. In that it doesn't want to let go, hmm. um, and th this idea of of stripping the knowledge from it um, to be left with with a with a, a blank platform per se when it goes beyond the the, the veil hmm. back into this place of nothingness, um, they have to go through this transition in which they 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 shed the life, they shed the memories, which is then stored within the void, and. You know, we often call that the global consciousness, um, and Edward Casey called it the Akesic records. Mm -hmm. uh, but remember when I said that the soul was the seat of all our psychic abilities, we can access the conscious connection, or the 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 the, the um, that uh, global consciousness, I should say. Mm -hmm. We can access that with you with the ability of the soul. Remote viewing is a perfect example of of us utilizing the the the, the soul to re, uh, bring back information. Um, that in itself is is a key aspect of of the soul. Now, when we end up in a situation where uh, we have a confrontation um, of something which which is not to our benefit, and sometimes they can be exceptionally traumatic. Um, what tends to happen is that over the course of, of days to weeks to months, some people may start developing um, extrasensory abilities that they never knew that they had. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they see this as a gift, a gift from whoever it was that was communicating with them. But this hypothesis, we where we put through our own hypothesis and challenge this idea. We say, no, that is not a gift. That is our our shadow, our soul, stepping forward to the plate. In other words, it does not want the Trinity to be in that situation again and tries its damnedest to make sure that, that we're, we have abilities that go beyond to make sure that we don't end up in that situation again. Do you know, it's quite interesting because the in the past, this, this battle for good and evil, light and darkness has forever been present. And, you know, whichever story has been, uh, you know, told or which film has been reenacted, it's saying the same thing, good over evil. But I think, you know, the title of your book, The Deception of Gods and Men, is so profound. And also one of the things that's really catching about the cover is the hand above uh, and the one below, where it looks like it's coins coming out of one hand mm. and being fallen and turning to dust in the lower yes. hand. Mm. And I think that that is an apt description of what is going on because the, the full parts become many parts. And mm. I think that what you're stating here categorically proves that, you know, researchers who are still battling for pole position to gain the answers to all of this phenomena are still very much uh, deluded. Now, I want to ask you also, um, Barry, about the stones, because mm. this is another interesting area uh, that you covered. Can you explain, please, Barry, about these stones, the rocks? Sure. Um, from, from a Neolithic period, uh, we had visitors from from the Fertile Crescent um, over by Syria and Iraq, and they came to Ireland via um, uh, um, southern and northern Euro Europe. Mm -hmm. um, they settled. They initially came down through Orkney um, um, into the UK and moved across into Ireland. There, they started using um, stone chambers to commune with these beings from beyond the veil where information was being passed back and forward and this particular process goes back 
thousands of years. We're looking at the, at the birth of Babylon and before, because we see evidence of these mound builders before Babylon. Um, and this particular process, this, this connection to the stone is vital to understand the nature of this phenomena. Because not only do we have um, UFOs that fly into cliff faces, into mountains and everything else. Mm. Um, we also have entities that appear on stone plateaus, um, on in cave systems, um, on cliff edges. Um, we also have with, within within um, English English culture, within the the, uh, the the fairy traditions, you have this particular um, creature. Oh my goodness, I can't remember the name of it. Um, Anyway, okay. its name its 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 name is 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 derived from from Middle French, um, goblin. Um, so the Middle French is gobelin, and that is derived from from the 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 older Germanic term kob, which in itself refers to a hole in stone. So we have got that that particular idea that this folklore um, um, aspect of of a creature coming from stone. On into this reality. Now, when we look at at this idea from from modern Irish perspective, we see the mounds um, as as these uh, um, burial chambers. But that necessarily wasn't the case because they were repurposed at that particular period in time. So before that, these these mounds, we had these creatures, these beings coming from the mounds, and today we see them as the she, and we have this this, uh, this this creature, which I, I wrote a book about, um, and it was just released uh, the end of, of March, Banshee, where this, this entity comes forward and, and through this terrible and sorrowful weeping and screaming, she, she announces death is approaching some particular person. Um, but I break the name down because... Ban and she is is woman of we were led to believe was woman of the fairy. The she were the fairy. That's not the case. The she were the mounds. They were the Neolithic mounds in which they came through into this reality. So here we're seeing this materialization from nothing into something. Again, we see this the nuts and bolts phenomenon within the ufology. Um, so. And when when we look across then to our to our comrades in in America there, and uh, and David Politis does, has has written amazing work there on uh, on missing people that uh, that have vanished exceptionally mysteriously within within the, the national parks, and he released a series of books there called uh, Missing Four One One, in which he goes in and looks at these very very bizarre cases, and he has admitted that the majority of these people disappear. In boulder fields. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, that kind of like, uh, you know, makes me wonder because I used to have a recurring dream about this stone circle, uh, these huge rocks. And in the middle mm -hmm. of the rocks was this tower. And within the dream, the sequence never changed. I'm frustrated because I need to find the correct sequence of rocks to touch in order to gain entry into the tower. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that, you know, I've heard this many times before about UFOs going into rocks. You're absolutely correct. And then people disappear around rock formations, mm -hmm. especially where there's water as well, you know, which uh, I don't know what that's all about. It could be some kind of energy or something. Mm -hmm. um, but dear Lord, that is frightening. And, and I do know that a lot of the cases that David Polides had investigated, a lot of the times there was always some type of uh, medical uh, issue with the individual that went missing, mm -hmm. um, or even if on a mental level as well, too, which I find fascinating. I mean, you know, I think what you're you're researching and you're discussing, Barry, is absolutely incredible. And also with regards to the theories that you have presented that's been coming forward with this, it's very profound. And, you know, I've always been a person who's been very open to all forms of conjecture because we just don't know. But I think that where, where you're going with your work, it certainly is quite incredible. So this force, this omnipresent energy that is in the darkness, that is, is in that space with no spaces, 
crisis where it's literally pitch black can manifest itself and then latch on to someone or anyone from that darkness into the light and uh, just to live so in your your idea barry about uh the phenomena um the deception that's going on i mean people have made quite a lot of money from it haven't they (laughs) (laughs) they have and uh, you know, when, whenever we look at at the, this this idea of, of of seeing and identifying these liminal places where we're more likely to have an experience, we use satellite technology now where we can pinpoint these areas in any country around the world, both north and south of the hemisphere. And there are two particular key areas of of interest. They're they're um um positive magnetic anomalies and negative magnetic anomalies. Mm-hmm. And David Politis's work fitted in neatly into, into my own when I was able to see that the majority of, of his um, cluster disappearances were happening in positive magnetic anomalies. Now, these, these are also the places where you tend to have that uh, that particular type of, of uh, natural UFO. You also have um, mutilations, abductions. Um, you have oh, poltergeist gosh. phenomena appearing there as well. Skinwalker Ranch is one perfect example. It, it, it appears in one of these positive magnetic anomalies. Um, but the anomaly itself for Skinwalker Ranch is over 80 miles long. So it's not just the ranch; it's, it's 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 circling around the ranch and beyond. Um, but beyond, no one else is really looking for the gold. That's all I'd say there. Um, <laughs> but uh, in in regards the negative magnetic anomalies, that was a different kettle of fish altogether. Um, and that, when I initially came across the phenomena that was appearing in the negative magnetic anomalies, I, I, I threw it to one side. I said, no, that, that's, I'm, I'm, that, that's not quite right. I'm going to have to go back and, and look at this. And I, I threw it to one side. But we also find that within the negative magnet, magnetic anomalies, you tend to find a majority of sacrificial worship that our ancestors were using uh, tended to happen within those particular areas. Blood worship, spilling of blood, was huge in in these particular areas. Now, moving that into the modern aspect, we also see that 75% of the world's top suicide locations also appear in these particular areas. So something is drawing people to those particular areas. And... uh, Interestingly, though, when when we consider the idea of spilling blood and everything else, we also see that 70% of the world's weapons development labs and storage areas are also in these areas. And I wonder to myself, that can't be by chance. No, that is incredible, isn't it? So, Barry, I need to ask you, do you believe that, you know, I know that people have their own idea about, you know, secret military establishments or uh, secret scientific uh, units. Do you think that someone somewhere on this planet really knows what's going on? And this is why they can't tell the people. Well, that was a line from uh, Baroness Margaret Thatcher, uh, which Eugenia Bruni, when it was questioned about Rendlesham and about UFOs, you can't tell the people. Do you, do you think that, you know, some people know what's really going on. Well, for yourself, obviously. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yes, there are people that know what's going on. And if it ever got out how and why, um, there would be a revolution. Um, because this idea of, of, of controlling people and power and ego and wealth, um, which was, which was, a, which was a, a, a promise given by the word, if you followed their their lead um, was, uh, you know, if we if we suddenly realised that that we had been sold, um, oh, there would be there would be an, an absolute revolution. So absolutely, and Barry, do you think um, because we've we've only got about seven minutes left uh, here as well, too, but do you think, Barry, um, that you know there's any hope for us? I mean, my idea has always been that you know when I pass over, that, uh, you know, we will pass into a greater 
a reality, um, you know, I don't want to have to come back and and reincarnate because that's very boring, Barry. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's a long process and it really gets tiresome. Um, but do you do you think that we ourselves will be able to come back, or do you think within your mindset that we just will be in this this darkness at all? What's what's your feelings or thoughts about that? Um, our, our, from what we, from what we were able to see, is that our spirit heads back to where it needs to be. Mm-hmm. Um, so call that the next level. Call it Belvedere, whatever the the, the case may be. We do enjoy something beyond. Mm, um, I see. What, whatever that, whatever that is. The problem is, um, Philip, that today in this world, we are driven so far apart by opposing positions mm. by by this good versus evil the black and white and um, the yin and the yang uh, this this world is, is has been designed to really focus on that and create this huge chasm between between us as a species and that's something we need to step away from we need to stop seeing this as an 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 a, a good and a bad and, and things like that. We need to step away from that. Um, and I think by doing that, then we will start to to wake up to this idea that, wait a minute, there's something else going on here. Um, and we really start to see this. And that, I, I think there's great power in 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 that and you know we really should be careful about what we are calling in the idea of of just lifting a, a voice recorder and saying is there anyone there can you come forward to me and give me a sign that you're here we need to be careful with this idea we really need to understand that we're the ones that are opening the door initially for this to come back um so we have to we have to address that um and we have to take ownership of that 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 a lot of this has been caused by us per se um and uh, and and move on from that yeah uh, but we also as i say we need to be careful about what we're calling in this whole the idea of 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 the the angels and things like that again the book itself really gets us to question what we're calling in for assistance it reminds me of the old babylonian demon uh, 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 demonology um, um, yeah. things um, where if, if you were being haunted in your property by a particular said demon, you brought in another demon, a higher ranking one to, to create peace and that's pretty much what we're at um, and we need to be careful about that we need to question what it is we're actually calling forth from yeah. um, and you know when when we consider the likes of of um, Jesus, for, for for instance, and this this is something that I have to be very very careful with, um, because today we have this idea of this white man with a beard on the cross, um, and uh, and his name was Jesus. His name was never Jesus. Jesus wasn't attributed. To, the the title Jesus was not attributed until this, the middle of the sev- the eighteenth century. Mm-hmm. Um, so when we go back and we look at this particular idea, we see that that this aspect of Jesus. Is is connected with this idea in, in the medieval period of this white man nailed to a cross. That is an archetype that we created. Mm, interesting. The, the the person the person whose name we're trying to call in is very different, and he was a different different appearance and everything else. And um, we would be completely unrecognizable if he was here today. Um, <laughs> but. This, this idea that we're calling in the good, what are we calling in if that if that did not exist? What are we calling in? That's right. How powerful is that? And, you know, Barry, um, I, I've just been so awed. I, I, as I said before, um, I could listen to you for hours because, you know, I, I think that you're an amazing researcher, an amazing author, an amazing a nice guy uh, all around as well too and i met both my twin brother and i met your lovely and charming wife donna as well we were very honored we had a great time but your work is incredible so where is this leading you are you working on any more books barry at all 
I am. Yes, I, I'm. I'm working on a book at the moment, and uh, and it's it's called the Fruit of the Gods, uh-huh. and it's it's. It's looking at this particular fruit that falls on the, on the summer solstice and how that in itself um, is energizing a situation in which the doorways can be opened. And this is something that's that, that I've tracked back to Babylon. Um, and, and that in itself has completely blown my mind um, with, uh, with a lot of the doorways and things they like got and, and what's coming through them. Um, so I, I, I don't know where it's going to end. Um, it's still in, 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 in process. And yeah, mm, that sounds it's, it's, really it's, interesting. It's, it's an intriguing one. You just get some of that fruit for us to, to take down <laughs> and we'll get to those gods and I want a word with them. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, you know, Barry, your work and your research is absolutely incredible. And I have to say to our listeners out there, um, you know, I can't tell you, you need to get this book. Um, You know, anyone interested in, you know, any area of the paranormal research or UFO research, whatever floats your boat, The Deception of Gods and Men by Barry Fitzgerald and Brian Allen. The price of power has never been so great. You need to read this book. It's available um, via Philip Mantle's Flying Disc Press. You can get it on Amazon. And I believe it's on Kindle as well, too. And I think it's on audio as well. Audio book as well as well so it's gone through the the whole stages of being developed and and well well rightfully so well worth the efforts there that, that i feel there so barry how can people get hold of you and uh, they can find me on facebook philip um or they can they can uh, nip across to my uh, web page at uh, at charmstealer.com and uh, and they, they can find more information on documentaries ri- uh, written there and uh, previous books as well well, that's amazing. And, you know, I, I just want to thank you, Barry, so much for coming on board. Um, your work and your research, your books are amazing. And uh, I just can't tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that, you know, Barry Fitzgerald, this man knows what he's talking about and has some really amazing ideas. And uh, you should be, you know, credited for contributing this research within the paranormal and I have to use the word UAP UFO uh, departments investigations so um, thank you so much for coming on board Barry I really am very honored and I'm very grateful for your time and also for your uh, your work as well thank you very much you're very welcome and uh, go out and buy the book ladies and gentlemen The Deception of Gods and Men by Barry Fitzgerald and Brian Allen available from Amazon in all formats go out and buy it you won't be disappointed and as I always say stay safe but I'm not so sure about looking towards the stars now